Okay, <laughs> thank you for introducing me. Uh, my name is Matthias, I'm very pleased to be here again, um, presenting the new challenges of uh, tough negotiations, especially uh, in venture deals. Um, it's about impact. I would like to show you what I, what I think about impact in a negotiation. If you don't know me, uh, Miriam told you already, I'm a, I'm a former hostage negotiator, so to negotiate with hostage takers, bank robbers, and suicide attempts. And I started my career here in Munich. As you can see, I speak Bavarian English as uh, our minister yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> After a couple of years, I joined the drug enforcement agency. I worked undercover uh, for six years here in Munich. I bought drugs, I sold drugs. I was working with drug dealers. Um, then I went to the university, and after studying, I went back to the Ministry of Interior. So what we do now, we are, we are, I'm running my own institute. We are based in Zurich, New York, uh, Hong Kong, and Dubai. What do we do? We support difficult negotiations. And I would like to thank um, Mr. Trump <laughs> for bringing in a new negotiation style also in politics. <laughs> Uh, and Mr. Boris Johnson, for example, it's really, really interesting what's going on right now. Uh, there are a lot of tough negotiations going on, and what we do, we support our clients in difficult situations, in deadlock situations. Uh, they call us if they have no idea um, what to do. We support a lot of uh, startups in, um, in the exit negotiations, and I would like to focus on, on, on startups, on your business, in my speech because there are new, uh, a lot of new challenges um, coming up. Uh, the world is changing and negotiations are changing. And I would like to focus on the new challenges. What I would like to show you is impact in a negotiation. And I have 20 minutes to go very quickly through the four most important elements. So I would like to show you the new preparation of a negotiation because what we have seen very often that your preparation is, is wrong. <laughs> that it's only a rational preparation, but not an emotional preparation. Well, I would like to show you how to prepare uh, for tough negotiations in the future. Opening, that means how to start a negotiation, yeah? how to, to approach your negotiation partner. Uh, we will talk briefly about the leadership in a negotiation. Uh, as a former hostage negotiator, I'm trained by the FBI and we always advise our clients to use our FBI model and we will talk about the escalation, so what to do if you can't reach an agreement. Um, let's start with preparation and let's start with the target. The target in a hostage taking is it's quite easy. My job is to rescue the hostage and to arrest the hostage taker. In your negotiation it's more complex, more complicated because it's not just one target, you have a bigger target. Uh, there are more topics in your negotiation, in a negotiation called a uh, zone of possible agreement. So it's, it's definitely more difficult to define the target. You have your target and you have more topics, so you have a wider range of um, topics which you want to achieve. So what I would like to give you a brief example. Let's say you want to negotiate against me, you say, well, this, this speech is, is interesting and you want to do um, you want to hire me for an in-house uh, workshop and you will ask me, Matthias, how much is it for uh, a speech in-house? My fee for a speech is, if it doesn't work, <laughs> um, so what do you think, what's, so, 100, as an example. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So what do you think? Do you think there is a possibility to negotiate? Do you think there's a room for negotiation? Or would you say it's take it or leave it? Do you think there's a room? No. Yeah? Um, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You have no idea, is it 100, take it or leave it? Or if I would be able to move to 99 or 98? Um, let's say my walk away position would be 60. Very important question. Do I have to tell you my walk away position? Should I say 100 would be great, but 60 would be also okay? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Next question, now it's getting complicated, watch out. Are you allowed to ask me, Matthias, what's your walk away position? <laughs> no. <laughs> because if you would ask me, you would force me to lie. 
Because if I, I told you already 100 and you ask me, Matthias, let's do a shortcut, what's your walk away position? Then I have to say 100. And then it's set in stone. Very important, there are two or three things you need to, you need to know from my perspective. Number one, you need to create your own target, which needs to be huge. And you need to define your walk away position prior to a negotiation. What we see very often in a tough negotiation that our clients, that they change the walk away position, which is not very smart, because if the pressure is very high, then you will change your walk away position. Very important, before you start a negotiation, write down your walk away position in writing, yeah? and you can't move it, especially not under pressure. Also very important, never think about the other side, because you have no idea. So, or in other words, stop guessing. Don't, don't try to find out what they want to do. Don't try to find out their walk away position. Don't ask for a final position, because they will never tell you the truth. Stop guessing. Keep on your um, negotiation, focus on your target and on your walk away position. And in, um, in negotiation in the future, you need to define, your, to formulate your target, and you need more. Because the world is changing, negotiations are changing, uh, globalization, everything is digital, so you can't hide a negotiation anymore. You need to involve um, the community. At the end of a negotiation, there are just two uh, possibilities. Agreement, so you reach an agreement, you have common ground, or um, disagreement. And disagreement is very dangerous because disagreement means you walk away and you hand over the, uh, you can't control the negotiation anymore. You allow the other party to control the negotiation. Um, I'm sure you observed the Brexit negotiations. So what do you think? Is Boris Johnson, does he try to reach an agreement or a disagreement? What's, what's his target? Is his target agreement or disagreement? Disagreement. disagreement. Uh, the problem is, if you talk about a disagreement, you start a war. He's using the wording from World War II. He is creating this conflict based on, on the wording, which is very, very dangerous. Um, disagreement is very dangerous because you start a war, like Trump is China, talking about the war, the trade war with China, or Boris Johnson. To avoid war, you need to focus on a new topic, which is... I was really impressed about this slide yesterday. Um, Felix present, um, came up with this slide yesterday in, in, in his presentation. It's about the global goals. So what, what we have seen very often, um, it's, not, it's not enough to formulate a target in a negotiation. You need to formulate your target and you have to combine it with one of these icons. So you need to create a target which is bigger than yourself, which is more than numbers and figures. You need a story. Why? Why do you want to do it? What, what's your mission? Why do you want to change the world? Is it because clean water or is it because, uh, let's say, quality education? You need to come up with a story for your negotiation. If you don't come up with a story, you end up like this uh, buyer and Monsanto deal. Um, I'm sure you have observed this, this negotiation, buyer and Monsanto, and as you know, it's not very successful because there was no storyline for this negotiation. No one, you know, do you know what, what's, what's the big idea about this M&A? Do you know it? Because no one told you. There was no story, there was no positive mission for this story. That's why the company, the team, is not following this process anymore. So what you need to do from my perspective, formulate your target and, also very important, uh, combine it with your um, negotiation topics. You need to, ch to choose one of these topics. You need to do more than numbers and figures. This, uh, this uh, buyer in Monsanto deal, it was just from a rational and financial perspective a success, but it was not a success from, a, let's say, from an overall perspective. Again, choose one of these topics, 
combine your negotiation strategy with one of them and tell the world why are you in this negotiation, what's the big driver to do it. After creating this scenario, um, we'll talk about the, the opening. Opening means how to approach your negotiation partner, how to start a negotiation. From a negotiation perspective, there are two options. Number one is you start a negotiation with, with the so-called low-hanging fruits. So you go through the garden with your basket and you collect the low-hanging fruits, um, meaning you talk about the easy stuff at the beginning. Big advantage, you move fast, a lot of progress, big disadvantage, you have to, to handle the stumbling blocks at the end. I'm sure you have observed the negotiations with the public government about this climate contract. Um, they made a huge mistake from a negotiation perspective because they started with low-hanging fruits. They talked about the easy stuff, and at the end, yeah, they talked about the stumbling blocks. They didn't reach an agreement, as we know, and now they came up with this, from my perspective, ridiculous, embarrassing um, climate contract, which is very, from my perspective, disrespectful, yeah, because they achieved nothing. If you start... <laughs> If you start a negotiation with low-hanging fruits, yeah, please keep in mind at the end of, of the negotiation process, you have to handle the stumbling blocks. The other option is, um, we call it to put the fish on the table. That means you have a fish, you start with this fish, you put this fish on the table, that means you tell them what you want. If you create a conflict at the beginning, you force your, the other party to negotiate with you. You don't allow them to come up with arguments. You don't allow them to discuss the topics. They have to negotiate. So what, what we have learned, if you, if you want something, if you want a better price, for example, uh, you need to come up with a fish. You need to tell the other party, this is what we want, right at the beginning. You don't have to come up with a reason for this fish. But if you, don't, if you hide this fish, it starts to smell. <laughs> and then it's even more difficult to present the fish. So what we have learned um, in tough negotiations, especially in, um, in venture deals, tell them what you want right at the beginning, no reason, uh, just tell them what you want, and then you force them to negotiate, and then you come up with this fish, and then it's easier to negotiate. Um, leadership. I'm a former hostage negotiator, and a host as a hostage negotiator, you never negotiate by yourself, you're always in the team. Because if you're, if you're alone, under pressure, you make mistakes. I have to admit, I made a lot of mistakes in my life because I was emotionally involved, emotionally attached, and then I made huge mistakes. In a police operation, there is always a negotiation team, and I would like to show you our so-called FBI model, and I would like to give you some new insights about this model. So, in a police operation, there's always a so-called decision-maker. Decision-maker is responsible for the entire operation. And as you can see, a decision-maker is not part of the negotiation team. He or she is handing over this so-called license to negotiate. So, this is our target, that's our walk-away position, that's our license to negotiate. And we come up with the so-called commander and negotiator. As a negotiator, you pick up the phone, you dial the number, you call the hostage taker, you have the so-called single point of, of contact, you talk to your opponent party because you know their language, you know their philosophy, you try to reach an agreement with the hostage taker. And very often, they don't agree. <laughs> so they go against you and then you're emotionally attached. This is why you have a commander. Commander, that means um, there's a colleague sitting beside you, supporting you, helping you. My advice, if you negotiate an exit, for example, always keep in mind um, it's an emotional negotiation. I'm the founder of my company, and I have to say, if I would sell my company, I would be emotionally involved, because I work day and night to, to set up this company, 
and I'm sure it would be a, there would be a lot, lot of emotions in a price negotiation. So what I would like to say, if you're, if you're a founder, if you want to sell your company, don't join the negotiation team because you will make huge mistakes. You are the decision maker. Send in a negotiation team. You need to send in two negotiators, a speaking negotiator and a non-speaking negotiator, the commander. The negotiation starts with the commander. Commander is talking about the big picture. It's talking about clean water, about quality education. It's talking about the big picture, why you are in this negotiation. He, is telling, he or she is, is telling them, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to negotiate. Let's get started. Then the commander is handing over to the negotiator. Negotiator saying, well, this is what we need, starting with the fish, putting the fish on the table. In very difficult negotiation, you shouldn't be alone, and it should be just two of you. Uh, in some negotiations, you negotiate against, let's say, against American companies like IBM. Yeah? Uh, they, they come by bus. <laughs> <laughs> and then you sit there, two of you against 10, 20 people. Yeah? Um, you can't change the other team, you just can't control your team. If there, are, if there are more people involved, you don't care. You're always a negotiator and a commander. If you're a founder, if you're a CEO, keep in mind, for you, it's the negotiation of your life. For a private equity investor, for example, it's a day-to-day -day negotiation. Yeah? They're not emotionally involved, but you are. In a deadlock situation, and in a tough negotiation, there's always a deadlock. Uh, do you know this situation? You exchanged all ideas and all these uh, options, and you can't move forward? And then it's time for the commander. A commander would say, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for expressing your concerns. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to exchange ideas, and I would like to thank you for this willingness to reach an agreement today. Why are we here? It's about quality education. It's about clean water. So you can use your overall strategy to come back to the negotiation strategy. Uh, you don't get sidetracked. And then you, you can always come back to your agenda. The commander is coming back to the agenda, and the negotiator can continue. So for tough negotiation, never negotiate alone. Always try to set up this negotiation team. And I would like to focus on the last two minutes <laughs> to the escalation. So what can you do in the last minute of a tough negotiation? What you usually do, usually if you don't get what you want, you come up with a threat. Threat means, if you don't do it, I will. I was at the airport uh, last week. There was a mother with, with, uh, <coughs> with her child telling her, at boarding, you know, at the boarding gate, telling um, the child, if you, don't, if you don't finish your lunch, you won't fly with me. <laughs> so it's a threat. <laughs> the problem is, if you're threatening the other one, then you have to do it. Yesterday, we, uh, we listened to um, President Barack Obama. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, an outstanding president, that's for sure, and he made a huge mistake. Do you remember his negotiation with Syria, President Assad? Uh, he told them, if you, if you would use chemical weapons again, we will step in. He used chemical weapons again, but he didn't step in. So he lost his face in, uh, in this global uh, polit political environment. So the problem of a threat is not that you block the options of your counterpart. The problem is that you block your own options. You can't move anymore because you have to do it. So in a hostage taking, for example, you're not allowed to threaten your hostage taker, you always come up with a warning. A warning is completely different. So I would like to explain the difference. So what is a threat? A threat is, I tell you a negative consequence. It would be in a hostage taking, dear hostage taker, I'm sure you have seen the snipers. If you don't come out right now, I will tell the snipers to kill you. <laughs> That's a threat, obviously. <laughs> so what's a warning? A warning is completely different. In a warning, you would say, the hostage taker, thank you again for this opportunity to exchange ideas. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you again for your willingness uh, to reach an agreement. 
we appreciate your effort in uh, reaching an agreement here. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure you have seen the snipers. Can you wait a little bit? <laughs> okay. Well, um, based on my previous experience, I know after two hours, if you don't send a, a positive signal to the headquarters, after two hours, the headquarters will take over this, the lead. I have no idea what they will do. <laughs> Snipers. <laughs> so we are in the same boat, dear hostage taker. What can we do to reach an agreement? So a warning has three elements. Number one is there is always a common interest. You are in the same boat, you are in the same situation. You want, together, you want to find a solution. Number two, there's always a process behind you. If you're a procurement, you would say it's an internal buying center. If you're in sale, it's a profitable whatever process. Uh, there's always a process behind it, not, not a single person. It's always a process. And number three, you hand over the responsibility to the other party, say, well, um, what can we do? What's, what could be an option for both parties? Matthias, so to summarize thank it, you so much huh? for your willingness to stay in time. <laughs> I really appreciate the effort. And now you're allowed to summarize it and then we deep dive into the questions, okay? That's highly appreciated. Thank you for the willingness to let Absolutely. me summarize. Absolutely. <laughs> Give us um, the last slide back, please. Okay. So, just to, to summarize it quickly, during the preparation, it's not only the target, you need a storyline. Number two, opening fish, not fruits. Number three, always show up with the FBI team, otherwise you can't lead a negotiation. If you don't get what you, what you want, don't threaten your opponent party, always come up with a warning. And so, in a nutshell, what we have heard yesterday from President Obarak, Politicians, very often, they follow, they don't lead. Um, we, are, we are entrepreneurs, we are founders. Um, we are responsible to get things done. So what I would like to say, choose one of these icons, paint the big picture, and then we get it done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Responsibility to make sure we get, a, get some uh, questions answered. Um, thank you so much um, for this summary. Um, as I said um, in in our in your introduction, uh, we know each other for quite a while. And um, what I really like, I mean, there's so many techniques uh, techniques that I that I use so often. But what I really like about your approach is this uh, role of coming back to the actual purpose of a negotiation. Yep. Right. So, um, to start with a personal question from my side, uh, what was what was one of the most impactful, most meaningful things you negotiated for? Um, the meaningful. Well, the life of a hostage is always very meaningful. Very meaningful. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit frustrated and energized by this discussion about Friday for Future. What because does that mean? Um, I talked to, to Luisa Neubauer, you know Luisa, from the, the face of Friday for Future. Germany. Um, Germany. Yeah. Uh, um, and um, so we talked about what could we do with this discussion. Because Friday for Future, um, it's a great, it's a great um, movement, it's, 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 fa it's a fantastic um, element to show the politicians, they have to do something, mm. but they haven't achieved, right now, they haven't achieved their, their target. Um, I offered them to, uh, to negotiate with the government, and they told me, um, it's not the job of the kids to negotiate, it's the job of the politicians to understand. Mm -hmm. And I would love to negotiate for Friday for Future, because this is a very meaningful target for the future. Well, I hope you will yeah. get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at what, the qu what questions the audience raised. Um, how can we summarize that? Well, the first one? Uh, what <coughs> your hardest, no, well, let's start with the last one that we see here. What was your hardest negotiation? I know people love crime stories, but could you, you know? 
My heart is still summarize it or, or give an example that that uh, is applicable for a founder as well. Well, well, I, I think that my hardest negotiation. Um, I used this example last year on stage, where this uh, I was in a hostage taking, and, and the guy in front of me told me, uh, "Get out of here, otherwise I will kill her." Yeah. I used this example last year, and um, the. What you could learn from this example, if you start a negotiation, there's always a lack of information. So you, n you never know enough to make a decision. That means at the starting point of a negotiation, never commit yourself. Because you, if you commit yourself at the beginning, uh, you will lose your face at the end. And this was, from my perspective, the, the most Im important learning. Never commit yourself in a negotiation. Always say words like difficult, like interesting, thank you for expressing mm. your concerns. I appreciate the willingness uh, to reach an agreement. Um, never commit yourself, because if you're committed, you will lose your face. This is uh, also reaching to the first question here in the sense of how should you start, right? If we, if we play too big, um, it doesn't sound realistic. If we play too small, there is no ne room for negotiation left. So how do you find that sweet spot where we start? Well, um, it's <clears throat> regarding to two elements. Number one, in the culture you're in. Um, if you are, let's say, I want 100 for my speech. Mm -hmm. um, if I would, if I, I would, do know that's not true. <laughs> if I if I would negotiate with a German partner, I would start with 110. Yeah. So in 10 percent more. 10 percent more. In India, I would ask for 300. <laughs> In Arab countries, I would start with 1,000. Is, yeah. that, is that, I mean, it, you know, you make your, our audience laugh here, but is that actually true? It's true. Okay. In Switzerland, it's 101. Yeah. And I, and I would feel very, very bad about this. <laughs> um, because um, from an international perspective, it's, it's how, how do you want to play the game? The second element is, are you a rational negotiator or a gambler? Mm. Rational negotiators, they believe in cause and effect. Gamblers, they start with a ridiculous demand because they want to play the game. Yeah? Um, well, we don't have a lot of trust in, in people who like gambling, right? So that's the issue. Well, um, Mr. Trump, for example, is a gambler, obviously. Yeah? And no one wants to play with him. Mm. Well, <laughs> phew. And, and actually, you know, that's an interesting <coughs> example because he's so stubborn, let's label it like that, um, that um, he's actually, in some cases, really uh, getting to the point where he wants to because people are trying to get out of his way. Exactly. So, but what is it that, he, I mean, and yet he doesn't serve as a good example. Um, so what is it that we can learn from a personality like this in a negotiation type, like he represents, and what is it that we should not copy? Well, uh, negotiators, so the gamblers, they only respect you if you accept it's a game. So if they come up with a ridiculous high demand, mm -hmm. like Mr. Trump said, Germans, you have to buy American cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah? It is, it totally. Is, yeah? <laughs> so, um, so he's setting a, you know, he's starting with the demand, and then he, he's testing you. Uh, do you accept it? It's a game. Do you come up with a really ridiculous uh, demand as well? Mm -hmm. And then we could play the game. Okay. If you avoid a demand, then I know uh, you're not on my eye level, so I don't respect you. Okay, so it's about um, building an eye-level relationship. Exactly. It doesn't matter what play you um, are you playing, but you need to kind of step into the game that um, okay. is offered to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually this, the second time you're pointing at me, but I'm, I'm happy <laughs> that you're not doing the weapon again. Okay. So um, I know I that you're not <coughs> going to answer the next one, um, but what I learned, <laughs> what I, uh, the salary of your talk, by the way, we're not paid. You committed founders um, in this in this surrounding here, um, but uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I remember from a former speech that you gave, but it's a while ago, um, is that you um, started to um, that your your rates are actually negotiated by other people than just you because you start you explained you're actually taking it personal if someone uh, negotiates your rates down, and this is something that I totally applied. Yeah. Not so much in the sense of that I um, ask my team to negotiate my rates, but in the sense of that I. Um, I'm willing to mention, okay, if you, if you do not stop negotiating my, my rates, I'm actually going to take it personal. And if I'm not enjoying working for you, then we, you know, yeah, you're not yeah. going to get what you want. Exactly. So that works pretty <laughs> well. Um, so this is as much as you will get as an insight um, for this question. Um, 
Well, you, we already tried to, uh, or you already explained a little bit, elaborated a little bit for, about the Fridays for Future movement. So, um, you know, I mean, you're a negotiator for so, so many years, and there are tons of, you know, entrepreneurs and C-levels that go through your institute as well, and the training that you offer. Um, what is it that, you know, from the former training that you got and the applications that you had in those really cutting it uh, moments to who you are as a negotiator today, normally we become, the older we get, the more peaceful we become. I don't know if that applies to you as well. No? Okay. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Well, I see that um, you need a conflict. You, you need to create a conflict. You need to step in with the demand. You have to force the, the other one. To, um, to negotiate against you, because we need this fight, we need this... Um, what do you enjoy so much about fighting? Um, well, I need a better result, because if you don't fight, then you end up with this ridiculous climate change, whatever, contract from the German government, hmm. which, which is, is not embarrassing, worth which is embarrassing, which is, which is disrespectful to our kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no one started a, 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 real, a real conflict. And um, I, want to, I want to get a better result out of it, and that's why, so coming back to your question, what I'm really wondering that, that most, of, most of you guys, uh, you're well prepared for day-to-day -day negotiations, but you're not prepared for this, for this deadlock, pressure, emotional uh, situation. Yeah. And this is what we teach, this is our, our expertise. Uh, well, we, uh, everyone who works with you knows how much value you're contributing and how much it can be a game changer to have someone uh, with, uh, with the desire and commitment to fight for a good cause, um, like you do. So thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.